Good evening. You're listening to The Extreme Movie Show. I'm your host, Rob, alongside with me is Professor Pixel. We're continuing our coverage of Twin Peaks. We are currently on Season 3, Episode 1. Now, Showtime relaunched this, or I should say continued it because it's not a reimaging. David Lynch, Mark Frost were involved in this uh, continuation of this 18-episode series, I believe. And Professor Pixel, when this came out in 2017, there's a little bit of buzz about it. We we're starting to get more, I think, in the mainstream about rebooting franchises, reimaging them, rewriting them, recasting them um, with different sexes, races, genders, whatever you want to call it. And right now, I got to say this to me, this episode stands out as how good Twin Peaks really can be. Because as I said to you before, in our current review of season one, season two, and Fire Walk With Me, the number one thing I liked about this was if they, when they went dark and they went a little mysterious, um, they went a bit more with the adult themes is when Twin Peaks was at its best. Not the stupid humor and some of the shenanigans that they that befell them in season two. So right off the bat here, um, watching this for the very first time, uh, you are as well as myself, we have no idea what to expect. We're going episode by episode, season one here with episode one and two, they were shown at the same time, same thing I think three and four before singular episodes before the very last two, but we're going to treat them all one at a time. So we just dial in in the nit gritty dirt of this episode. And I got to tell you, initial reaction for me is, wow, what a really fantastic, good looking episode with some of the shots. This thing seems like an older, more mature Twin Peaks. And there's just something about the flavor of taking most of the characters that you can, finding a role for them and doing all the things that I had said I thought Lynch did that was a positive for Twin Peaks, giving people something to do, putting unrelated things together that we know uh, seemingly may tie into again at the end. Um, and even though we started off uh, season one, episode one, way back in the late 80s, early 90s, with Who Killed the War Palmer, now it's, holy crap, uh, Dale Cooper's doppelganger, his evil side, he's out roaming around. Where are we at? What's going on? What happened to him? Is he stuck in the Black Lodge or the waiting room or whatever? What happened to uh, all the other characters? We don't know. We're about to find out. So let me ask you, what are your initial impressions of this episode? My initial impressions are, um, what the hell? <laughs> and it's not a bad what the hell. There is There have been episodes which have called for a bad what the hell did I just watch? But there is a lot to unpack here and i'm not sure what i'm unpacking it's like looking into a mystery box and then suddenly you pull out a boot and then you pull out another boot it's this, just two right-footed boots where's the left that's the question uh and if that doesn't make sense that's how i felt watching this episode <laughs> but i i think the it's best not an way easy to, watch yeah but i but i think the best way to uh start talking about it give true thoughts on it is to start going through with it and the first thing right starts, on the head. yeah the first thing it starts us off with is well the red rooms laura palmer uh saying hello to agent cooper it hits you with that nostalgia uh and as you as she says what she said last time i'll see you again in 25 years uh but for the moment and then she does the weird arm thing and instead of her disappearing it fades to black that's when suddenly fog above the trees comes and as we're moving forward we move towards twin peaks and that's and as we're going through we go through like streets and stuff and eventually go to the school and it looks like it's classic footage until we get to the school because it gets close it clears up and we can see a picture of laura palmer and that's when the music starts the logo comes up we move across the waters overlooking the waterfall down below red curtains overtake the waters and we get a flash of that classic black and white zigzag floor until, well, we're past the intro. Um, I, I, I really like it, but at the same time, I'm yearning for that classic one. I didn't know what they would do. Uh, and I know this is a lot of time to spend on an intro, but... 
<laughs> but it's important because it, the the intro and the music the music was I, it was as a major hit back at the during the day the theme and all that it really was different than anything at the time back in the 80s 90s when it came out so you know pausing here before going on to the, the next scene um to me i agree with you totally i will say that this is beautiful and i'm so thankful for a super high ultra 4k you know 8k 90k whatever you want to call it the, these high def television sets and drone shots because to be able to have a tool like that that can give somebody like lynch the, and, and whoever's working with them with the camera shots the ability to produce these is great um and like you i didn't know what to expect um I think one of, that's going to be a major theme throughout this whole review over the next couple of months going through every, each individual episode is some people might say, oh, well, they can only do what they can do because they don't have everybody. So it's not really Twin Peaks or, oh, it's so easy to redo this because all you got to do is just mash up the, uh, the introductory waterfall scene a little bit and you can call it Twin Peaks. And I go, you know, it's true. And so I can't argue if somebody says it, but the effect I think is what matters here. And for to me, it's just an absolutely beautiful shot, like a, you. I was saying, the, in the way you described it, too, of everything going there. That instantly drew me in. And I think you had to have a good hook with the nostalgia, like you say, Cooper and Laura, because that's what it's all about, basically. And then the theme, once it hits, I didn't know if they were going to start with the theme or not or whatever, but, man, really, really great. Um, totally, totally, I'm hooked at this point here, too. So take us to this next black and white scene. Yes, black and white. We see the giant with Agent Cooper. Um, both of them are, uh, you can see the age on their faces. And the giant tells Cooper to listen. And we look at a phonograph. And there's a sound that's kind of like scratching coming from it. Uh, and that's when the giant says, it's in our house now. Uh, Cooper asks, it is, and the, the the giant doesn't go on about that. He tells Cooper to remember 430 Richard and Linda, two birds with one stone. And Cooper, in his classic fashion, says, I understand. Nobody else does. <laughs> Cooper always understands. The giant tells him he's far away. And that's when Cooper and the giant just stare at each other a moment. And that's when Special Agent Cooper fades into a kind of static. Then we move uh, over the mountains. There's color again. And into the woods we go. Someone is living out there. We see this red truck. And I thought it was going to be Hawk, but it wasn't. It's a delivery man. And he's delivering two boxes to Dr. Jacoby. Dr. Jacoby comes out, takes off one of his sets of sunglasses because he has the other one on. Uh, and delivery man asks, how's it going? Good as ever. And that's when Jacoby goes into the boxes, pulls out shovels, and uh, it says he likes to work alone when the delivery guy offers to help. Yeah, to me... Um... <sighs> You get what you get with the giant and Cooper. I don't know why they did it in black and white. I like to again reiterate the drone shot here, being able to look down on Twin Peaks with a high level drone shot as opposed to like say plane footage or helicopter shaky cam stuff from the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, how, the old school methods. It looks fantastic. It's like wow. What I also like about this episode is that we're getting a dose of that right off the bat to hit us in the head and then it changes because we're going to be bouncing locations frequently and I love it. But for something about this next scene here, and this is going to sound strange, and I can't explain it well, but it terrifies me. It's broad daylight out. You're in the middle of these woods. You've got Dr. Jacoby, um, who, gosh, Russ Tamlin, I think he was probably 80-something when this is filmed. My goodness, he's been around. I mean, he looks it, but he still seems vivacious enough walking through. There's not really a lot of words, like you say, just a guy dropping off uh, his package and it's a bunch of shovels. And of course, we always think shoveling dead bodies, you know, digging up buried treasure and stuff like that. But, and of course that means secrets, but I don't know what the hell is going on. And he's in, in this piece of crap cabin and all that too. And it just, it feels really different. He it's, it's almost like he's gone prepper kind of, 
you know, off the grid in a way. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it's short. I, I don't know why I find it disturbing, but, but I do. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like it's a bad scene, but there's something eerie about all this. There's no goofs. Maybe it's because it's been five, 10 minutes in, into the episode. And we haven't had any that it's not, you know, going to happen because nothing does. He, he, he unwraps a few shovels. We see him, we see him standing in front of like a couple pallets where he's obviously been used to getting deliveries. It seems like that that's what the setup is. So what is he doing way out in the middle of nowhere? hell if I know, but I'm already curious to find out. And what's interesting too is, is when, once this ends, immediately go to New York city and some fantastic uh, shots, uh, overhead shots of the city all lit up. And it's not lit up like where every city light and every office building has, you know, the different cars on tops of buildings. It's for the most part all done a certain way. I don't know how to explain it. It looks very old school, uh, giant computer in a room sort of look too I, I don't know how to explain it, but that's an artistic thing somebody with better vocabulary with this kind of vision could do it because there's not a lot of color to it it's just a weird look obviously it's probably fake but it's stunning as they have some overhead shots and we zoom into an older red brick building surrounded by a bunch of contemporary looking high rises and this extended sequence here if this doesn't draw anybody in i, I don't know what will there's a guy sitting on a couch by himself. Young man, looks like he's in college. Call him and he's Buzz staring Cut. at this Buzzcut. I'll call him Buzzcut. Okay, so Buzzcut. He's there watching, looks like a glass or giant plastic opening, or, you know, it looks like a cube that's put into a wall where when you look into it, there's like an opening to the outside where you can see buildings. And that's it. But you see a bunch of these cameras um, all around him and you know military industrial looking lights on and everything too so obviously they're watching this space and there's nothing in this room too it's it's it's, a, it's he's got one concrete slab he's sitting on with like one or two lamps by him and that's that's it and we see him you know having a cup of coffee his eyes are closed we see him changing out the uh little usb type uh files here because they're obviously recording stuff so obviously it's some sort of science experiment for like a better term they're recording something um, whether it's atmospheric changes and things in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, I, there's all this gadgetry, and we don't know what the hell this is. We don't know who this kid is. We've never seen him before. We've got uh, a guard that looks really, really mean and stone-faced. He's private security officer at the door, and this tall, very leggy, um, very girlishly looking in the face, um, lady shows up with a long jacket on and a couple of gigantic enormous coffees and you can tell right away um that between them it's it's an it's an interesting scene to me not because what they show us and what the guy's supposed to be doing but with what actually happens um between them the, the the interplay because if you're listening to this you could follow on with the dialogue and it makes sense too it, uh this young woman also looking like college age maybe mid-20s let's say tracy she's going back and forth with, with this guy sam talking about coffee and she's curious she'd like to go in and he's like well i can't really do it super top secret and i thought you know what's great about this is the two things that's going on on the surface the flirting that would happen in a situation like this where you can't do something and as a young woman she's got to be aroused and turned on by the curiosity of the situation here's a guy that she's come to know because he's gone to the coffee shop so she brought him some coffees but she can't see what he does and it's top secret and you know they're both young they're, they're decent looking um but he has the electronic code of the door and when he goes to put it in on the code we kind of see her kind of almost looking and it's like is she looking at the code or is she trying to look into the room and see what's going on so immediately i'm thinking oh if the guy's working on the top secret project he should have been and i assume so uh, um taught about certain protocols that you deal with with other people because of, of spies and so if you've worked any sort of mid-level or high level situations in say manufacturing or with the government you are told how to handle certain situations too so i found this to be a fascinating scene too because the guy's pissed he's not he's he won't let her in she wants to come in so we know she, at some point she's going to come in so i just really thought this was a great scene what's your take on these two scenes i didn't know the guy was named sam uh, <laughs> uh i i just learned that okay that's good to know because in my notes, I never, I never heard a name, so I kept referring to him as Buzzcut. 
Um, I, I got it from the subtitles later on. So yeah, that's yeah. Buzz cut Sam. They, they should have told us. Uh, <laughs> Tracy with an E. Yes, Tracy. Tracy. Oh, yeah, we like Tracy. Uh, but no, this scene, it feels very foreign. That, that's the best way I can describe it. Because we aren't in Twin Peaks. We're in New York City. We're not used to seeing a city of any kind. And uh, the shots do look a little fake to me with, with how they sweep through. And uh, But the a whole idea of this glass box, and for some reason, this guy, Sam, is taking the footage out of cameras, replacing it, marking it down, storing it in this vault. We don't understand what's going on, but clearly he has to watch the box. And him and this girl named Tracy, they, they know each other somehow, and she really just wants to get in. And we want to... I almost want to know why she wants to get in. It's just so that she can know. that. The, the, there's nothing to find it. I, I, I'm pretty sure. I uh, don't know. Don't know. But eventually, whenever she, uh, when, whenever she's told no that she can't go in, and she peeks at the code, and he's like, "No, you're you're bad, aren't you?" And she says uh, something along the lines of, "Oh, you, you don't know." And he takes both coffees, sits down, and he just watches the box again. And from there, thankfully, we get a familiar shot. A waterfall with the lodge right there. Ben Horn is talking to his assistant as we hear someone announcing themselves. Jerry. And <laughs> Ben has kept himself together. <laughs> Jerry has, uh, what's the term, gone off the reservation. Uh, he has this big beard he looks like a freaking hippie um and whenever uh beverly leaves jerry's first question is so are you banging her yet and ben is just not taking it he's like jerry stop <laughs> uh jerry then goes on uh to be asked by ben so, so what are you doing? Is when Jerry starts talking about the current, uh, the what? What does he have in his hand? An English muffin with. It's a pot wood. brownie. It, it was a, no, it wasn't a brownie. It had I'm jam. On it. Well, whatever. I'll get to that. Keep going. He acts like he's on brownies, but uh, <laughs> Ben goes on to say that he's pretty much thankful that Jerry's not working in the hotel anymore. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the two have uh, separated in their ways of life. But however, Jerry is in some certain kind of business and it is doing well from what he says. Yeah, so we go from one incredibly gorgeous woman to uh, uh, just an underrated one, and Ashley Judd, because she's the secretary, and she just looks phenomenal in here. I don't care if she's 45, 50, or whatever, but she's tremendous looking, and it makes you wonder, with Ben and his history, The one of the last things we remember about Ben, the two important points is, one, was he, uh, was he the father of uh, Audrey? Or, uh, I'm sorry, not Audrey, Donna. Donna. Uh, what? Donna, yeah. Yes, and... Um, but the other big thing, too, was this philosophical uh, moment, if you were, once he got hit on his head a second time you know, with another concussion where he said, hey, I just want to do good and all that. Because I always said he was good plot and scheme and being an evil bastard. And he, he gives off that vibe to me here. But um, she comes in and she's not a ditz or anything like that at all. Um, or at least doesn't appear to be the way she's dressed and the way she carries herself to a very professional. And as he says, too, and maybe this is just a modernizing of the role. Um, he says, no, 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 that's not a girl. That's that's a woman. Anyone like that has to be a woman. And actually, that's Jerry that's saying it. And you're right, Jerry's dressed up as a hippie, but it's banana bread is what it is. So this is about the time four or five, six years ago when selling um, cannabis and CBD type products were starting to go mainstream and stocks and everything were starting to get real big. Um, 
and he's basically saying, oh, she's a beautiful soul, and she's married. And he's like, yeah, I never would stop you before, because that's exactly what any guy would say to another guy that knows each other like this. You know, you're banging her. That's exactly what would say, so it's realistic. But to your point, when you said it feels very foreign in the last scene, this does feel like we're back at home, because it would not be the same without seeing Jerry on here. Um, but he's talking about his new hydroponic induced sativa blend is here. It's a touch of the mythic AK-47 by way of the Amsterdam Express baked into this banana bread. Whoa, I have some monster lightning going on here in the Pinos Palace, just west of Orlando, Florida. Pardon me, I guess I shouldn't have uh, taken this scene so lightly, but my God. It's a nice little scene to kind of just show them going on. We don't know what's going to happen, um, but it's a familiar room and everything too. So one thing I will say is that, again, seeing this in high def, even though the show wasn't ugly before, it just makes things look so much better. And modern's a really great way that I think you described it too, because you can see a lot of the wooden objects on his desk and on the back, and you can see where the window opens up to the outside because we then cut to another great looking shot for a split second, a transition piece of the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department. And who better than some anonymous person walking in um, so far, we've had a lot of shades of uh, season one. Some of the themes, stranger walking into uh, the Twin Peaks Sheriff Department, like the one armed man, Philip Ger Lieutenant Philip Gerard. But we get some guy that seems a little exasperated. He's looking for Sheriff Truman, and there's Lucy, 25 years older, acting exactly like how we got to know her. And she's like, "Well, which one do you want? Which Sheriff Truman, the one fishing or the one that's out sick?" And he's like, "I don't know." So he leaves his card and leaves and. This is all you need to have for her. Um, I think it's a pretty decent scene, but it's so short. It's just there, I think, to serve the purpose of saying, yeah, we're going to come back to the department because the next scene is at night. Looks like we have some version of American woman playing. Um, it's like typo negative is seeing it, but not nearly as cool. And uh, you've got these lights on a car going through this road and it's a sweet sweet mercedes person gets out wearing a slick black leather jacket his hair is all back and hey we have cooper's doppelganger now we know that he is out and about and he's going to this crappy looking shed in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night he basically just slaps you know a gun away from a guy's hand and walks in before he sees a rather interesting collection of individuals. And before that plays out, I'll pause so you can catch up. Yeah. Um, I don't, uh, w with the scene in the sheriff's department, it did feel like old Twin Peaks again, Lucy. Well, which one? And so, so, so apparently there's a second yeah. Sheriff Truman now. Uh, one sick, one fishing. And we don't know which is which. Uh, got, when the guy leaves a card, uh, as he's not getting an answer for her and leaves, I, I was unsure of what to make of it because the guy didn't say anything about what he's there for, except he's, he has to, uh, to deal with insurance. Yep. But from there, when we followed modern Cooper or double Dale, as I like to refer to him as, uh, it's very odd. And we remember how he was left. In in season two, at the end, in the mirror, we saw Bob. He's possessed by Bob. And so it seems uh, now he's really going for Bob's look with that hair in the back. <laughs> Let's just grow it out. And whenever we get into the room, I it shows... This one guy, I believe his name is Jack. Or no, Otis. 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 And Otis has to go get, well, uh, a girl named Daria and a person named Ray as this older woman comes out. Um, I believe her name is Beulah. Mm -hmm. And they talk for a little bit. And uh, he's, Dale says something along the lines of, where do you get these people? Yeah, you got to put someone better at your front door. And Beulah says it's a world full of truck drivers. And we can see in the corner, there's this, uh, there's this special individual in a wheelchair and this one who's just wearing overalls and just wearing overalls. I, at first, I was wondering, because I didn't get a good look at the man in the wheelchair, I was wondering if it was supposed to be 
the old woman and her grandson just 25 years later. Tremont and the little kid? No. But yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> but. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You no, know, I was I was going to go ahead and say when Ray and Daria come out, uh, Coop says they need to hit the road. And they pretty much do. They pretty much leave straight from there. Yeah, this is pretty much the uh, he's recruiting some white trash uh, scene or whatever. And I don't know a better way to say it. And that's not a knock on anybody, you know, actors or actresses or whatever, because the um, Darlene girl, she's extremely hot and in a very trampy sort of way. And she has what I would call a very exotic look on her face. It's it's um, very pointy aqualine um for the english people out there and, and, and one thing i gotta say here too about these two is um okay they're being recruited they all seem to know each other the one guard apparently didn't um and and bad cooper doppelganger cooper um my theory and i'm just interjecting this in now because i don't know what's going but this is how i'm thinking of it is that when he got possessed i think what really happened is because when good cooper in our world entered into the white lodge waiting room portal black lodge whatever um i think that allowed the bad one to escape so i think there's two there's a good and a bad but the bad's on the other side and that's where he's waiting um you know if he can ever come out which obviously we assume he's going to and that's why bad cooper's running amok um so i think it's two people i don't think it's just good cooper who happens to be like yeah. if you kill this physical presence, you know, it wouldn't exist anymore. I think there's two bodies, a good one and a bad one. Now that may be wrong. It may just be one body yeah. that's possessed by a bad spirit. I don't know. So we'll see what happens with that. But when, um, when we were watching fire walk with me and we see Annie Blackburn in bed next to Laura Palmer and he's, she says the good Cooper is in the black lodge. Yeah. yeah I'm taking that literally. Yeah. yeah. Is, is a way well, of just, understanding it and, and we can always test that later on because there's things like this that's going to come up it's not the show is right now to this point even with lucy um there's been really no fun stuff honestly it's been average and then some questionable and some deep stuff i think you know it's almost it's almost like a horror vibe i, I don't know how else to explain it because you're these people creep you out with the looks on their faces and some of the acting in this episode is either bad or they went for a certain direction. And, and I'm going to point that out later because I got that vibe from these two, which is what I was wanting to uh, say about it. And, and bad Cooper's he's obviously he's got his hair dyed jet black, whatever. And he looks like he has black eyeball contacts because it has no pupils in them too, but he is rocking the bronzer big time on his face. Holy crap. This guy looks like about an eight or nine on the uh, bronzer scale. It's really high up there, but good Cooper is in his bronze. So just, just another this whole thing besides Otis looking like he's uh, drinking piss out of a canning jar with a thing that looks like, you know, fingers or Vienna sausages in a bigger canning jar next to him. It's just a disgusting scene. And because of all that, it works because it kind of creeped me out. But they leave. She's got on her tramp shorts and, and all that. And the other guy's sneering at him. So we know something's going to happen there. But we get another cut of New York City. And we see, um, was it Sam buzz cut? Sam. Sam Buscut, he's, you know, updating his job. I'm guessing that's the next night or whatever. We get the familiar scene, or it's becoming familiar, of Tracy showing up with a slightly disturbed look on his face because she just simply says, and she looks at the guard station, which is literally a foot in front of her, hey, he's not here. And she's got more coffees, and she's got her usual uh, barista outfit on or whatever. It's, it's actually a nice-looking outfit, even though I'm assuming she's a barista. She may not be. It may just be whatever. Um very office woman-ish kind of an outfit. And so he stops and he looks and he opens up the door, knocks on a couple of times and it's the toilet completely empty. And she's sitting there and she's like, does this mean by any chance that I can uh, come inside? Um, and again, this guy, when you got a woman this hot that wants to obviously bang you, you can tease her all you want, but it, you know, with the older you get, the more you just say, I want to cut to the chase. Let's get down because he's got this, he's, He's had this weird look on his eye that has like serial killer vibes to me. The guy does not look like he's normal. 
even though he's a decent looking guy or whatever. And I, I don't know if that's bad acting. I don't know if that's intentional because other than her being curious, like anybody would be, especially a woman, I of course go, well, she's a spy because she, you know, she, she wants to get down. She's a little nervous, but he does kind of continue the flirting. He says, since there's no one here to stop you, if the, I guess you can. And when they walk inside and you see them get in there and she's like, whoa, and she's kind of impressed by all the top secret stuff, which is a bunch of cardboard boxes and a big empty thing. And he's like, I don't know. The last guy that was in here, maybe he saw something and I don't know what. And um, of course, like a dumbass guy, he kind of like start, he's thinking about the situation instead of reacting. He's like, well, you know, what if the guard comes back? And she's like, you're overthinking it. Um, and they keep going back and forth between them walking and sitting down on the one couch with the coffees, looking at this thing. And it's dark out at night, too. Um, they, you know, just take a sip and they sit there. And what I like about the scene is they let it play out, you know. And anytime you've sat with somebody and the first time you're going to have a heavy makeout session or get down or whatever like this. I, this felt very real to me. I don't know if people look awkward or not, but one thing I've got to point out is this, the shot here when they're drinking her coffee, he's getting ready to get down. He's slouching back. She's sitting up and her legs look twice as long as his. This woman has got an incredible body. She's cute. Um, just fantastic and all that. And this guy's looking at her and he's the way this happens. It's not pornish. It's not glamorized, uh, like say Body Double, the movie we've covered here on the Extreme Movie Show a few months yes. back. Uh, yeah, I know. It's it's just they start making out, and it's got that passion and energy. And they don't do stupid music. They don't do cutscenes. They you, you just watch them start going at it. She stands up. It's a brawl line shot down. She takes her uh, overcoat off. She's in her really classy looking panties, fantastic body. The guys, the entire time, if you watch him instead of her, the way it's shot, because they're both in frame, he's staring up at her eyes the entire time. And that's, again, I like that because that's pretty realistic. You're, you're, you're excited about what's in front of you, but the whole eye thing that first time is incredible. And he starts taking his clothes off. They start, she mounts them. She's completely nude. Uh, you get a lot of shots of them going at it and the electronics because then something happens. The box goes black. And while it's going on, you get some images of almost looks like an, a female because it looks like there's breasts and, but it's like a weird alien face. And I'm not doing justice how friggin' creepy this scene is. And again, with HD today and the way you can do things, love practical effects and all that. This didn't look like it was overly produced or anything, but they're both looking at it. And even though she's mounting him, she's turned over and they both look at it and they both have a look of extreme horn her face and they both scream and we end scene. Well, except Whoa. for a little thing that I'll let you continue with. Cause it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. It's quite explosive. It, when I saw the figure, I thought it was, I thought it was a woman too, but it looked like it had a hood. But when we get closer, we can see that it does look alien with these deep sunken eyes and this, this little mouth down there. It, but we don't get a clear enough look to tell what it is. And as the two are staring, suddenly it jumps at the glass. And seeing that it can't move kind of pisses it off. That's when it shatters the box. It goes up. And it starts cutting them up. Blood is going everywhere as this white figure is shrouded in darkness as it's just destroying this couple. And that's when it cuts. And we go to Great South scene. Dakota. Great scene. Buckhorn, South Dakota. Yep. Buckhorn, Beautiful shot, South too, Dakota. to introduce it. Oh, I love it. Oh, it's so, it's, it's so great. Go ahead. It... There's this larger woman with a dog, um, and they are walking in this uh, kind of like an apartment complex. And the dog is suddenly pulling towards the door. And that's when the woman knocks and she calls for Ruth, who I guess lives there. And then there's no answer. So the woman rushes to her room and calls explains hi my name's marjorie green there's a terrible smell coming from my neighbor's place do i know my address no i don't know 
it quickly cuts to down the hall. Uh, we get close to the apartment door, and it's on his wonder what's in there. And that's when the police come. And uh, they ask Marjorie, who's out there, uh, about the smell. Marjorie just goes ahead and she leads them to the door. Uh, they go ahead and glove up and ask if the man manager's there. And Marjorie starts going on about... <laughs> She she's like, oh well, the manager he's usually here. Uh oh, but he's not here. He has to go to the hospital, not the normal kind of hospital, if you know what I mean. But he she le he usually leaves it with his brother. But I've never met his brother, so I don't know his brother. And it just goes on and on and eventually leads to a guy named Hank. They go outside to see if Hank, the uh, handyman, is there. And Hank is saying, Harvey, that son of a bitch, is that why you're here? And the police officers don't know what the hell's going on. They just need a key from Chip. And, Har and Hank starts going on about, how did you know I was visiting Chip? That's when the lady decides to come out, and <laughs> she asks if maybe her neighbor Ruth is out of town because she's supposed to water her plants, and she has a key to the apartment to water the plants. This makes Deputy, Deputy Dumbass look like the most intelligent man I've ever met. <laughs> you know, for me, I, I this is going to sound weird. I love the scene, but I, I, for some reason, and part of it's because I didn't know what to make of it. Because originally, when she was walking through the hallway, she, and it's a beautiful looking little chihuahua. Oh my goodness! Um, it's she's pleasantly plump individual. She doesn't seem real bitter. She seemed like okay, whatever. You know, you always have one of those neighbors on the street that you know waters plants for you, mother hen type or whatever. So she doesn't seem like a bad person at all. But it felt like to me that she was more than just nervous dealing with cops um because it's not the best apartment complex in the world but it's not bad it's certainly livable it's, it doesn't seem like it's a drug den or anything like that or section eight housing or any of those kinds of things that you know you associate stuff like cabrini green and government housing and you know what they always portray in movies as being horrible places this is a reasonable place for people that you know live and she's middle age um so and it's not not like a huge city but it's again with a beautiful shot that it, nothing looks ugly to me except for dr jacoby's uh yeah place that we saw briefly but yeah i didn't care for the back and forth and i thought well is this going to lead to something more because hank the uh, maintenance guy that's outside it occurred to me then that he's having a similar issue that she has and so i started getting intrigued by going do they both have problems are they both like short-term memory impaired is it because they're on drugs but drugs doesn't seem to work for twin peaks for what we're doing even though they were running coke back in the day um but i immediately caught on just based off of what we've experienced with season one and two of twin peaks that hank obviously is talking about something unrelated and misunderstanding we're supposed to get it it wasn't supposed to be for me i didn't take it as funny so if it was supposed to be like a little lighthearted it for what's about to come it did not work to me um yeah. because hank's on the phone he's talking to the guy harvey calling him up saying hey why'd you send a police meeting you know and they're talking about some some something that happened and he hangs up i'm going well is this going to be related because you have to think you know somehow it might be and we're we're in the middle of a place we've never even heard of um in twin peaks and i love the fact that while we're getting towards the end of this episode we spent at least two thirds, three quarters, the entire time of this episode not in Twin Peaks. I love it. I think it's a great thing because you get this um, guy, this investigator coming in, um, and a detective, and without having a lot of the cutting going back and forth that you know we've mentioned before, I was a victim of television, especially in season two. Here they kind of let it play out a little bit without darting back and forth and this i think to me said okay this is going to be the heart of what's happening in twin peaks i hope because this is really great see the detective showing up but you also see the forensics woman show up um they take their time they walk in and of course it's in the bedroom and you see a body a head there looks like it's left eye been like 
shot out with a gun or something or whatever. There's no real signs of like violence in the in the in the place or like it had been robbed or any of those kinds of things. You know, the guy says, "Uh oh." But what's neat is when they pull the sheet back, what you see is the head had been completely decapitated, and the body below it. It's got a lot of hair on its belly. It's extremely kind of fat. It's bruised. It's disgusting. It looked like really, really bad CGI to me, which unfortunately made me almost laugh and start to take it seriously. But the fact is, is it's like that body, that that face, it's decapitated, disgusting. And you know, there's not been too together. much dramatic music playing. Right. But we didn't find that out at this particular point, but we do in a couple minutes. But yeah, let's finish that up before the next scene. Yes. Uh yeah, I mean, I, I could pretty much tell with how much hair was on it. It did not look, uh, it did not look at all related to the, I, it's hard to say that a head that's missing an eye of a <laughs> decapitated from his body is attractive, but the woman didn't look hideous. Uh, but from there, that that's actually where it takes that turn that makes you kind of, oh gosh. Because you never saw anything like this in Twin Peaks. Never. Uh, e even with the darkest things that they could do, they did not have the ability to show as much as they are right now. But from there, I'm grateful to return back to the trees where we belong into Twin Peaks to see the log lady. Have you missed your girlfriend? What? Your girlfriend, the log lady. She died not too soon after filming her scenes from what I've read and researched yeah. about her. So yeah, you go ahead and take the scene. Cause it's, it's, she delivers it very emotionally. And I don't know if that's acting or just because she was not obviously in good health at the end here. And it's just as the best she could muster in her yeah. painful situations. But uh, the pain as she delivers her message really comes out. Go ahead. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, she has the phone there and she calls the sheriff's department to talk to Hawk. Deputy Chief Hawk. And she says that the log has a message for him. Something is missing and he has to find it. It has to do with Special Agent Dale Cooper. And the way he will find it has something to do with his heritage. Hawk is a little confused, but he thanks her. And she is, like you said, clearly emotional. And I don't know if it's supposed to be or if she just knew that she didn't have long in this world afterwards. They say goodnight and that's the it, it cuts from Twin Peaks back to Buckhorn. Um, I think we can just go right ahead to the Buckhorn Police Department where they're yep. scanning the prints uh, that they found. And it belongs to this uh, this man that I didn't recognize in his license. Uh, <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> uh, it's tremendous, though. But they have his height actual realistic because this is a tall dude, tall actor. Well, but let's, let's keep going. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, they <laughs> recognize I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> they recognize that the prints belong to this man, uh, but the body is still a John Doe and uh, a John Doe and clearly doesn't go with Ruth. Um, he, I'm trying to remember her last name. Ruth. I don't know. Just Ruth's head doesn't go. So Dave goes to see a man named Bill Hastings. He's the uh, principal. And he goes to the door and says, uh, I'm sorry, Bill, but I have to arrest you. And the, the wife of uh, Mrs. Hastings seems really bothered. We have guests coming for dinner tonight. Can't this wait? Yeah. <laughs> but clearly <laughs> Bill's disturbed, doesn't know what's going on, and he's taken in. Yeah, let's pause right here and I'll, I'll catch up to this because we're really pretty much getting down to one of the last big scenes to, of the whole episode. Um, to me, the whole log lady scene was interesting because when Hawk, his hair is almost completely white. It looks exactly the same style. 
he looks fantastic. He does not look like he's using the, you know, the bronzer that uh, Cooper is. He's aged very, very well. And David Lynch to me does not strike me as what people today would call a woke individual. And we can argue about whether things like that are good or bad in movies and TVs and just pop culture in general. But the bottom line is, is there's something neat that I think him saying, hey, this is going to have to do with your heritage that's appropriate because we mentioned before that Hawk, we only got them in small doses, but they were good ones, powerful, competent ones um, over the first two seasons. And it, they've, it's a part of his character that's been untapped and it makes sense. So I like the fact that it has something to do with it because when we were in Twin Peaks, we felt like we were in the middle of nowhere in a small town, even though it was the late eighties, early nineties, there were computers and everything like that. Even though it's 30 plus years ago, it's, it's nice. And, um, him and Lucy being having an interaction after seeing Lucy, it works. And that's only a quick scene, but I popped really hard for this because I'm like, this guy looks familiar. He's almost smirking, almost smiling. He's got the goatee and he's an older dude. He's six, three, he's a tall dude. And all I'm going to say is for the people that don't know who he is off the top of your head, this person's character, William Hastings, the high school principal, the address that they pause on right before they transition over to picking him up is, elm street <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> so i thought that was pretty neat like like a nightmare in elm street it kind of i popped for that i'm like that's got to be deliberate but mm -hmm. yeah right when they pick her up the, the wife seems a little annoyed that she can't have her dinner plans and she's aged well i don't know who this actress is but i thought the actor here did a great job mr hastings character because he's like no no it's just a mistake him and the cop have known each other since high school he's like uh call george you know their lawyer or whatever like that have him meet me down there at the station i'll go in or whatever um it ends really quick because it's the next day of course and hawk's got these two boxes and or it's the evening it's still not the next day and you get lucy coming in and he tells them what's up he basically says hey um, I've got something going there and it has to do with Agent Cooper. I'm going to need you guys to get the boxes and put them all here on the table. I'll bring the coffee and donuts. You get Deputy Dumbass who walked in there too and he gets a chance to say something. This guy, I'm not going to say he's aged bad. He's aged well if you look at the face, but he's definitely a little portly, but he's that skinny fat where he just has the belly because he's tall and lanky. He's a foot, foot and a half taller in one scene. It's, it's tremendous the difference between him and Lucy. But his voice sounds exactly the same, you know, a deputy dumbass, as we like to call him. Um, so we assume that they're married, uh, of course, because she chose him uh, over Dick Tremaine <laughs> towards the end of season two. So it's nice to see him just for a minute, even though we've given him a lot of grief <laughs> over the two seasons. But the way Hawk is with that beautiful, long Indian hair of his and bringing out the really, really old looking boxes that look like they're 30 years old. I'm like, wow, pretty neat. Again, like we said, they didn't spend much time in here. Um, but when they cut back to the Buckhorn Police Department, again, you see this actor beside himself a little bit saying, hey, can you just please tell me what's going on? This other detective shows up um, and the police chief's watching and and basically Hastings, this principal guy, and he looks like, you know, principal. He's, he's tall, lean, middle-aged. He says, he, I, I don't really know this, this woman, Ruth Davenport. Um, he says, I, I think she was our librarian. I hadn't seen her for a few months. And the guy's questioning him. The guy questioning him is his old buddy. And he's like, well, when did you get out of your curriculum meeting? He's like, 9.30. What time did you go? Oh, about 10.15. It's like, well, it's about 45 minutes. And then you see him start to lose his grip on his story because he starts panicking a little bit. He's like, well, I had to take my assistant home. And then he didn't really want to talk anymore. And he wants to talk to his lawyer. And as that's when the uh, detective says to him, hey, Ruth Davenport's been murdered. Your fingerprints are all over. And he goes and he puts them in a cell and he wants to speak to his wife. Um, the actor, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's Matthew Lillard from Scream. <laughs> I just thought it was tremendous because he plays this nervous, twitchy kind of role perfectly, and he does not go over the top like you might think he would. Okay, he's fantastic in his role here. It totally works for me. It's awesome because really the only thing that happens at the end of this episode besides 
leads to this is that the two detectives go back to the home. They have a warrant because they're going to search the home and the car. Um, they go through just about everything. They open up the trunk and they see like this chunk of flesh uh, underneath, uh, like a some cool. stuff that he had in there. Yeah, it's not an ear or tongue or anything like that. It just looks like a piece of flesh, and that's it. Um, and then we cut uh -oh. to the way we started with the giant in black and white. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and you recognize him from Scream, and obviously I do too. But my first thought is Shaggy <laughs> from Scooby Doo. A lot of people will. Yeah. Because he does the voice for Shaggy, and he played him in the in the movies in the early two thousands. But uh, yeah, no, he's phenomenal in this. It, it's totally unlike we're used to seeing him. Um, but the, the this ending right here, it while it does take us out of Twin Peaks again, I want to know what the hell <laughs> because I don't know what's going on. I understand what's happening. But there's pieces missing, and I gotta know. I got to know. And I know. just the ending with the black and white giant for some reason in black and white, and then closing up on the phone phonograph. When the credits came up, I was well, for one surprised because that's not how we're used to ending this. Um, yeah. And I just kept watching, it, and it, it was in part from.